into dancing, mourning as in, you know, weeping, wailing, uh, lamenting, mourning, into dancing. And the, uh, the psalm that's before us, Psalm 30, is, is a resurrection psalm. It's a psalm about how God raises the dead and gives them life. And as I was thinking about this this morning and thinking about the, the song, Mourning into Dancing, I thought to myself that if the Lord was going to take away my mourning and turn it into dancing, he would have to teach me how to dance because I have no moves. But Denny would not have that need. This guy has moves. It's wonderful. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you raise the dead and that you give resurrection bodies. Lord, we thank you that you not only rescue, you instruct, you give life, you you teach us the way that we should go. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. We pray that you would convince us that you will indeed make death not the end not the end for our loved ones, not the end for us. And Lord, we pray that you would cause us to people who live like there is a world to come, a new heaven and a new earth and a resurrection body and tasks that we will have to do to glorify you. Lord, we pray that you would make us like Christ, willing to lay down our lives because of the joy set before us. We ask it in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Yesterday in, in the Wall Street Journal, there was a, a story about a hostage crisis in Alabama back in January of 2013. This crackpot, this old man, he was described as having lightning strike white hair, and he was a grievance collector, and he had, he had piled up in his mind all of these ways that the government had wronged him. And he had decided that he was finally going to do something about it. And so he, he concocted a very elaborate plan. He got a neighbor uh, that, that helped him to, to dig this pit, this bunker, really. And then he built, he built this thing out. It was all equipped. It, it, it was amazing how, how well planned this whole thing was. Um, in, in the bunker, there was this strategically placed ladder that was at such an angle that if you tried to jump down the ladder instead of crawling down it, you would inevitably land on the bottom rung and probably break a leg. And, and then in front of the ladder, he had, he had set up this, this web of, of uh, poles, this, these rebar poles that would make it so that if somebody tried to jump over the ladder, they would land in that web and not be able to land down in the bunker. And the whole thing was, was constructed so that if they tried to take the bunker, he would be able to, you know, shoot them like sitting ducks as they came for him. Well, what he wanted to do was he wanted to take a child hostage, and then he wanted to demand a female reporter replace the child, hostage exchange, and then he wanted a live stream broadcast, nationally televised, so that he could air his grievances and make his case to the country. And so he he boarded a school bus. He first befriended the, the driver of the school bus. And then, then he boarded this school bus, this unsuspecting driver who'd been friendly with this guy. And he demanded two children. And the driver, heroically, I mean, this is Alabama, the driver said, I'm sorry, I can't give you two children. And so he said, well, if you won't give me the children, I'm going to have to shoot you. And the guy said, well, you're going to have to shoot me because I'm not giving you two children. He shot him, shot him dead, seized a child, and then took the child, five-year-old kid, into the bunker. The FBI, the Secret Service, I mean, the, it was like the, the country's powerful elite service forces descended upon this little town in Alabama to get this child back which is something about our culture that we can look at and say, that's good and right, and we affirm the value of the life of that child. But then there are other aspects of this whole scenario that that I think we rightly, because we love people, want to 
say to our culture, for instance, we know why we care about the life of that child. Why do you care about the life of this child? You know, this is not like a, a, a our culture, I think, thinks this is a self-evident universal value. Well, if you've been following the news, you know it's not a self-evident universal value for, say, soldiers in the Afghan army who take children captive and then keep them enslaved for their own use. And then when Americans try to intervene in that scenario, the Americans are removed. So this is not a self-evident universal value. Our culture, this is one of those cut flowers. Our culture values the lives of children because of its Christian heritage, this idea that humans are made in the image of God, but secular people in our culture don't want, they can't acknowledge that that's why they value the lives of these children. And, and I think we want to say to them also, we value the lives of not only five-year-olds, but also five-week-olds, five-month-olds. And we not only value the lives of these children, but we want to see them flourish in life. So in, in, this, in this story, they actually, you know, the, this child, he's in a pit. Look at, look at Psalm 30. If you've, if you've turned there, we're going to look at Psalm 30 this morning. I would invite you to open to this passage. David's going to say in verse 3, you restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. And then later in verse 9, he asks, what profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Well, this, this crackpot in Alabama had taken this child down into the pit, and he had the child down there for five or seven days while they're trying to figure out how to, how to get him out. Well, finally, they, they, um, they deceive the guy, they attack the bunker, they rescue the child. At great risk to the men who, who charged the bunker, essentially these three guys, they figure out a way to break in and try to rescue this kid and, and, and they, they wind up killing the, the hostage taker and they, and they get this child out, which is great. Again, we want to say, well done, this is wonderful. You rescued this child's life. But then the child goes back into a horrible situation at home and is, is essentially in a failing school. And, and again, I think we want to say, if you love this child enough to rescue him at the risk of your own life, why don't you love this child enough to, to introduce the kinds of discipline and the kinds of teaching and instruction that would actually lead to this child having a great life? Because on those fronts, you know, there's this risk of human life to save the child's life, but then there's this utter failure when it comes to helping this child actually live well. Well, praise God, the, the God of the Bible doesn't just deliver us from death and then essentially say, indulge your selfishness, make your own way. Let, let's look together at Psalm 30 and we'll see, we'll see how much better the salvation that God brings is than, than anything that our culture could offer, than anything that the government could accomplish, than anything that the FBI could do for us. In, in this psalm, uh, I, I'm going to pursue it in sort of three moves, and I think, I think this is tracking with David's flow of thought. In the first five verses, it's, it's almost like David is looking back on what he's going to tell us about in verses 6 through 10. So, so verses 1 through 5 are almost after the fact, where, where David is essentially going to say, praise God who raises the dead. And then he's going to take us back into this situation where he was at the point of death, and we'll talk about how he's thinking about things. Um, it, it's almost like Sheol is reaching out its cords and getting them wrapped around David, and he thinks he's as good as dead. And then the Lord delivers him from that. So he, he first reflects on the experience, and then he tells us a little bit about the experience in verses 6 through 10. And then in verses 11 and 12, he again reflects on the experience. So there's an outline in your bulletin. Let's look at verses 1 through 5, where David essentially says, Praise God who raises the dead. And in verses 1 through 5, there are kind of two parts. The first three verses, David is going to speak uh, about how he is going to praise God. And then in verses 4 and 5, he's going to call others to praise God with him. So let's look at, at verse 1 here. 
Actually, first we should look at the superscription of Psalm 30. It, it tells us this is a psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. And, and I think this is important because it's, it's, uh, one of these, it's one of the first superscriptions we've had in a while that has any kind of information. And I think this is going to give us the, perhaps the background that, that is informing and prompting this psalm. So I'm, I'm not certain of this, but I'm going to suggest as we move through the psalm what's going on here. Uh, the dedication of the temple, you may have a translation that reads the dedication of the house. And, and that's going to pick up the passage that Denny read earlier, 2 Samuel 7. And, and you'll remember from that passage that David wants to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord says, no, you can't build a temple for me, but I'm going to build a house for you. So there's this kind of no, yes thing that David gets from the Lord that I think uh, informs this, this psalm. So um, in verses 1 through 5, he's praising God for raising him from the dead. Look at verse 1. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. It's interesting that Psalm 30 Psalm follows Psalm 29. If you were here last week, you saw that in Psalm 29, you've got in verse 3, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. And then in verse 10, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. And so if, if you're moving straight through the Psalms, it's like you're, you're in this rush of waters from Psalm 29. And then you get to Psalm 30, and David is saying, the Lord drew me up. It's almost like he's, he's describing the way the Lord pulled him out of those torrents and those floods. Um, and, and when he says, I will extol you, you may have a translation that says, I will exalt you. There's kind of a word play there, isn't there? I will exalt you. I will lift you up because you lifted me up, right? The Lord lifted David out of danger. And so David is say, saying, I'm going to lift you on my praises. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. David's foes are not only his enemies, they're God's enemies. And if they're going to conquer David, they're going to boast over the Lord. And David doesn't want any of that to happen. And he's praising God now. Uh, this again may connect up with Psalm 29, where the enemies of David are, are su it's suggested, I think, that they're going to be destroyed like the wicked were destroyed at the flood, while David, the righteous, is going to be delivered, and, and therefore the wicked are not going to boast over the righteous. So in verse 1, David sort of summarizes the experience. I'm going to lift you up because you lifted me up and you've not let my foes rejoice over me. And then he kind of goes back into the midst of it in verse 2. Oh Lord God, oh Lord my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. Now, now look at the, the way he describes this in verses 2 and 3. You healed me, you brought up my life from Sheol, you restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. So there's healing, there's bringing up out of Sheol, there's restoration to life from among the dead. Those who go down to the pit are the dead. So here again, we see the way that God, God doesn't just rescue from death and then say, in essence, go on living now in your crippled, broken state. He, he rescues from death and then he heals. He introduces wholesomeness into you. And, and so, you know, whatever it is you're dealing with, if you've got a congenital disorder or some kind of malady that you're facing and you're struggling with in this life, the resurrection body's not going to have that. You're, you're going to be raised to life and you're going to be healed. So it's not going to be this way forever. There's hope. If there's stuff that's all twisted up in your desires and your affections and your your ways of thinking, and, and you know that your mind is perverse. God is a God who doesn't just introduce salvation. He's a God who brings healing. So, so there can be this put off the old man and put on the new man. There can be new delights, new affections that can be introduced. This is what David is praising God for. Oh, Lord... My God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. Oh, Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. It almost sounds like resurrection from the dead, doesn't it? I think in the 
in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament worldview, uh, death was not merely when your brain waves stop moving across that screen in the hospital. It's not merely when you no longer have a pulse. Death extends to the domain or the reign of everything that's sinful and evil. And, and death, you partake of death if you leave the presence of God. So, so I think David is, is saying here, I was away from your presence and, and the wicked had power over me and it was like I was in the unclean realm of the dead. It was like I was in the grip of Sheol. And it, it's interesting to think about life and death in those terms because to truly live is to walk with God. It's to be in his presence. It's to know him. To have joy is not to find a way to get away with your sin. To have joy is to be delighted in obedience because there you enjoy the presence and the favor of God. So David says, O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. So verses 1 through 3, it's like God has raised him from the dead. Verses 4 and 5. He now calls on other people to praise God with him. And, and this, is, this is the way we are, isn't it? Something great happens, and we, we want to text our friends, or we want to tweet a picture, or we want to uh, do whatever it is that you do. We, we want to tell other people. We want to share it. We, we want to enjoy it with others. This is what's happening with David. Verse 4, sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. Uh, that word saints... It, it's it's the, this Hebrew term that's built off the word hesed, which refers to the Lord's loving kindness or his, his steadfast love. So you've got hesed, and then you've got the hasedim. You can, you can hear the connection between those words. And the hasedim, I would suggest, these are the people that are marked by God's loyal loving kindness. These are the people who have experienced God's steadfast love. So it's like David is saying, you people who have experienced what I've experienced from the Lord, his loving kindness, praise him with me. Sing praises to the Lord, oh, you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Uh, this tells us that God's holiness is connected to God's salvation. Th think about how that works. How is it that God's holiness is connected to his salvation? I would suggest that the connection is that God has given his word to accomplish salvation. And God is not an unholy God who breaks his word. God is not an unholy God whose character you can't trust. If God gives his word to save, he will keep his word to save. And that results in this, this call to give thanks to his holy name. In verse 5, David explains, I think, why, the, why those who are marked by God's loving kindness, the saints, should join him in praising the Lord. He says in verse 5, For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. The fact that there's anger indicates that David is aware of his own sin. I think it suggests that David is experience God, experiencing God's displeasure as a result of his deficiency, his sin, his transgressions. His anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Now, if we pair this with verses 1 through 3, the, the anger is going to result in the Sheol, the pit, the weakness or sickness that he needed to be healed from, and then the, the favor that's going to be for a lifetime is going to be paired to the bringing up, the drawing up, the healing, and the, the restoration to life. So I would suggest that this is, this is resurrection favor that's going to be for a lifetime. So we've got this death and resurrection motif working through this psalm. And then at the end of verse 5, weeping may tarry, for the night, but joy comes with the morning. This is, this is our hope as Christians, isn't it? Our hope 
is that all the stuff that we lament won't last forever. All the things that grieve us, our own sinfulness, the, the wretchedness in the world, the brokenness, it's not going to last forever. It's, it's in, in relative terms, it's for a moment. You can think of that little boy, Ethan, in that pit. He was five days with that guy. And, and this happened in 2013, and the reporter noted that, that for a time after this event, Ethan talked about this all the time. He talked about that man who had seized him on the bus. But now in the second year, Ethan is, it's like he's moved on. Two years go by, and, and he grows, and he changes, and, and this traumatic experience that, I mean, I never saw my bus driver shot. And, I mean, this is a, this is a very rare, and, and you'd think it'd be something that could potentially danger, uh, it, damage him for, for life. Well, he's, he seems to have moved on from it. Difficulties can be for a moment, and God's grace and favor are for a lifetime. Think about, think about eternity future in the presence of God. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. So there, verses 1 through 5, David says, Praise God who raises the dead. Now, there may be somebody here this morning who is not a, a Christian, maybe not even a theist, maybe not even a believer in God. And um, I, I suspect that, that for many who don't believe in God, part of the objection is, if, if I take on belief in this God, I'm going to have to take on the moral requirements that, get, that that God also introduces. And one of the things that we want to say to you as Christians is, well, those moral requirements may not be as bad as you think. They may actually... You may actually find that you like those moral requirements once you, once you begin to live in accordance with them. That, that's one aspect of this. But, but look at the trade-off here. If you don't have a God, you've got nobody to raise you from the dead. And if you have this God of the Bible, he can raise the dead. Look, don't you think it's worth it? Don't you think it's worth it that, that you live in such a way that, okay, I'm not going to be a thief. And okay, I'm going I'm to do everything I can to oppose adultery and the things that would induce me to that. And, and I'm going to try not only not to murder, but also not to even be murderously angry with people. And, and, and just walk, okay, I can, I can, these are actually maybe good things. And then there's this hope of resurrection to come. I think it's a, I think it's a worthy trade-off to take on the moral requirements of the God of the Bible and receive his, his favor and his power. But, but I want to be clear, there's, it's not just a trade-off. It's not just a one-for-one. One. It's not like other religions where if you do the five pillars, let's say, then you get the reward of paradise. No, we've, we, we Christians, we've all blown it on the moral requirements. We've all transgressed and sinned. And what God has done is he has sent a substitute to suffer and die in our place. So that if we turn from those sins and trust in the substitute, Jesus, his experience of God's divine punishment counts for us. And we receive the merits of the righteous life of Jesus. So having, having praised God who raises the dead in verses 1 through 5, David now takes us back into the, the experience in verses 6 through 10. And here's where I think the, the superscription informs what's going on in this psalm, perhaps. You, you think about it, you take it, um, you work it through, be a Berean, and, and consider these things for yourself. Verse 6, David says, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Here's what I would suggest he's talking about. First Samuel 16, the prophet Samuel anoints him and tells him, you're going to be king. And then immediately, the powers of hell, the seed of the serpent, start trying to kill him. I mean, the next chapter, second, or first Samuel 17, he goes out to face Goliath, who's trying to kill him and give his flesh to the dogs. 
And then succeeding chapters, Saul is throwing his spear at him, trying to kill David. And then he starts chasing him around in the wilderness with all these these soldiers at his disposal. David survives all that from Goliath and Saul. And then eventually in 2 Samuel chapter 2, he's anointed king over Judah. Then in chapter 5, he's anointed king over Israel. Then in chapter 6, he brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And I think at that point, he's thinking... I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Look at the promises that God has made for me. Look at the way that God has preserved me. Look at the the way that God has ensconced me here in Jerusalem and established the throne of my kingdom. I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Verse 7, by your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. This is reminiscent of Psalm 2. Where the Lord says, as for me, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So I think that's what David is talking about. Do you remember what happened next? It's it's the passage that Denny read in 2 Samuel 7. David, his desire was to build a temple for the Lord. what's, What's informing that? What's going on there? Why is David wanting to build a temple? Well... Uh, these temples in the ancient Near East, as we, as we talked about before, they seem to, to have been a symbol of the world as they conceived it. And the idea was that, that God himself would take up residence in the world. And in Israel, when, when uh, they build the tabernacle at the end of Exodus, end of Exodus 40, and, and this cloud of God's glory fills the tabernacle, that's almost like a preview or a promise. This tabernacle is a symbol of the world. God's just filled this tabernacle with his glory. That's what he's going to do with the world. And the same thing happens over in 1 uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 when they build the temple. David wants to get the temple established so that out from there, God's glory can extend over all the earth. And he's not allowed to do it. Look at the rest of verse 7 there. You hid your face. I was dismayed. So I think what's happening is David, he gets, he gets himself established in Jerusalem. He wants to build the temple to extend God's glory out from, out from there. And the Lord essentially says to him, no, you can't do it. And, and I think David is terrified. He's ter- this word literally means terrified. This word dismayed. He's te- Why is he terrified? He's terrified because to be banished from God's presence is to be sent out into the unclean realm of the dead. And I think that's what informs all this resurrection language throughout this psalm. To be out of God's presence is to be in the realm of the dead. To be in God's presence is to be in the realm of life. And and so it's like David is saying, you hid your face. I was terrified or dismayed. Why? Because I was afraid that I was not going to be allowed to enjoy the goodness of your presence anymore. But you heard the passage that Denny read. The the Lord says, no, you can't build the temple. But he goes on to say, but I'm going to raise up your seed, your descendant after you, and he will build the temple for my name. And I think that implies I'm not throwing you out. I'm not banishing you from my presence. You can't build the temple. That's That's going to disappoint you. But I'm not... I'm not casting you off. You are going to continue here in my presence. You are going to have children, and one of those descendants of yours will build this temple for my name. So I think that's, what, that's what's going on here, and that's what David is talking about in verses 1 through 5. He, he was afraid that his foes would rejoice over him. He was afraid that he was going to be banished from God's presence into death, and the Lord healed him and brought him out of Sheol and restored him to life from among those who go down to the pit. So he, he recounts that, uh, what happened there in verses 6 and 7. And then in verses 8 through 10, he tells us about the prayer that he prayed. Um, in verses 8 and 10, he essentially talks about how he's trying to get the Lord to listen. Verse 8, to you, O Lord, I cry. And as we observed last week, I'm not calling on anyone else. You're the only one I'm looking to. To you, O Lord, I cry. And to the Lord, I plead for mercy. Look at verse 10. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. So he's just asking, God, hear me. And then his request is in verse 9. 
And, and uh, it's, it's, it's presented to us in the form of rhetorical questions. He says, what profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Now, what's David saying? David is not suggesting that if he dies, everything stops and there's like no consciousness after death. And David is not suggesting that after death, there's no future resurrection. That's not, what he's, that's not what he's presupposing when he asks these questions. What he, what he is saying goes like this. If I die, who is going to praise you here on earth? If I die, who is going to lift up your name here and now in this world at this time? And, and the implication is, well... There may be others that he's called on in verse 4, but nobody who has the opportunity to do so like David. Nobody who's strategically positioned, nobody who's uh, king of Israel, nobody who's uh, talented to write all these psalms and lead all the people and, and so on and so forth. So what is David appealing to? David is appealing to God's concern for his own glory. Here, now. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust... Praise you, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? I think we ought to pray this way. I think we ought to pray this way about churches. I think we ought to pray this way about our own lives. Lord, I need you to rewire my desires. What profit is there in my death? Lord, I, we need you to work in these churches that are controlled by these people that, that don't regard your word. Lord, we need you to work in the hearts of these people who, when they need help, they don't go to your word. The, Christians, Lord, we need you to work in, because your name is at stake. What profit is there if they die? Be concerned for your name here and now. That's the way that David is praying. And it's interesting to think about the way the Lord answers. Because the Lord doesn't say to David, you can build the temple. He doesn't give him what, he's, what he wants. But he does say, your descendant, your seed, he will build a house for my name. So... So, you know, the, the Lord is concerned for his glory, but the answer to our prayers may not come in the way that we desire. So David has, verses 1 through 5, said, Praise God who raises the dead. And then in verses 6 through 10, he recounts this prayer that he prayed in, in the moment of crisis. And then in verses 11 and 12, he talks about what he is raised to do, which is give thanks and praise. He says in verse 11, you have turned from me my mourning into dancing. Uh, so David goes from lamenting the fact, I think, I think the issue here is, you are not going to be allowed to build the temple. And David is mourning that reality. To dancing. Why is he dancing? I think it's because of the promise of the one to come. I think David is rejoicing over and celebrating, even dancing over the fact that the seed of the woman, who's going to be seed of Abraham and seed of Judah and now seed of David, is going to be raised up and he's going to crush the serpent's head and he's going to make the world a cosmic temple for God's glory. He's going to build this building out of these living stones for sacrifices of praise. The church, which is the the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, so I think David gets this promise, and it takes him from mourning to dancing. He says, you have loosed my sackcloth. It's, it's like David has this, this um, I don't know, maybe something like a, uh, a, 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 one of those uh, bags of this roughly woven uh, cloth, and he's, he's put it over his head, and he's cut a hole in it, and he's cut armholes for it, and he's got a... A, a tie rat, and it's like the Lord unties that belt and throws it away and, and removes the sackcloth and then puts it, new garments on him, garments of gladness. 
Do you think of the Lord that way? This is what the Lord does for his people. How does he do this? Think about how he did it for David. He does it through his word. It was the promise of God that took David from mourning to dancing, from sackcloth to gladness. And then verse 12. That my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Verse 9. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? No, that dust is going to be silent. But now that the Lord has essentially, metaphorically, figuratively, raised him from the dead, uh, taken him out of the realm of Sheol and brought him into the realm of life, now that glorifies David. It exalts David because David experiences God's goodness in this way. But David doesn't seize the glory for himself. David says, my glory is going to sing your praise and not be silent in the grave. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Um, forever, literally we might, we might render this, to the age. I will give thanks to you to the age, until the age to come. And, and it's remarkable. Uh, this psalm is here in the Bible, and David is doing exactly what he said he would do. David is giving thanks to the Lord until the age, until the age to come. This psalm is going to be used, the words of David will be used to give thanks to the Lord. In Psalm 30, David has this near-death experience that he describes for us. This experience of, 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 of being denied direct access to God's presence and this fear of being banished from God's presence and, and thereby having to inhabit the lowest pit of Sheol. Jesus was forsaken by the Father, crucified and buried. David describes the Lord giving him these promises in terms of the Lord raising him from the dead and and restoring him to life. On the third day, the stone was found to be rolled back and the corpse of that man from Nazareth was found to have been given a transformed life. It wasn't, it wasn't just resurrection from the dead like a zombie, was it? No, it was resurrection from the dead and a resurrection body. It was, it was the removal of weeping and the replacement of it with dancing. The disciples wept through the night. Weeping may tarry for the night. But shouts of joy were heard that morning when the wailing was turned to dancing, the sackcloth was exchanged for gladness, and the praises began that will never be silenced. So Jesus has fulfilled the patterns of Psalm 30, and he's fulfilled the promises on which this psalm itself is based. Jesus rose to reign. So I would urge you, Whatever darkness you're in, whatever difficulty you face, there's hope. There's hope. Know that the night will not last forever. The sun from on high is going to rise with healing in its wings, and we will praise him forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you are the God who raises the dead. We thank you, Lord, that you can equip the most clumsy of feet with graceful dance. And Lord, we praise you that you are able to reorder our hearts. You are able to free us from sin. And we praise you that you have paid all its penalty in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, by whom we come. Amen.